The divisions that led to the Capitol insurrection still persist to this day. And many questions remain unanswered as the investigation continues. Mm -hmm. This morning, we're joined by Jason Whitehead. He's an associate professor of political science at Cal State Long Beach. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Jason. So take us back to January 6th. Where were you when you learned what was happening at the Capitol? And tell us about your reaction as the events unfolded. I was sitting in this very chair at this very desk, and um, I looked very much like I look right now. I was teaching a class. I was teaching um, a lower division course called Introduction to American Government, and um, had my phone on because I knew the electoral votes were being counted. So I was secretly watching a little bit of uh, TV news on the side, and I saw a man climbing up the side of the Capitol, and I thought, this can't be right. They're going to get this guy out of there pretty quick. And then all of a sudden I see the Confederate flag making its way through the Capitol. I see, you know, the scenes of mayhem that we're seeing on our screen right now. Um, as I'm teaching students about the founding, as I'm teaching students about presidential elections and things like that. So, um, you know, it was, it was a very sad day. It was also a very angering day for someone who's followed politics my whole life and who's really given my life to the study of American politics. Um, and I think for the country as a whole, it's been something not only to heal from, but really to figure out what do we do to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Well, you know, Professor Whitehead, I'm, I'm with you. I remember watching it. My mouth was hanging open the entire time, just like, wow, I can't believe what's happening here uh, in our country here. Uh, what does that attack say about the state of our democracy? Yeah, I think what it says about our democracy, that's a, it's a good way to frame the question, I think, because um, I think we can get blindsided by the fact that we are dealing with extremist actors that breached the Capitol that day and allowed the rest of the people to come through. And we're dealing with a stop the steal movement and a bunch of other things. So we can get blinded to the fact that our whole democracy, right, has some weaknesses that we noticed on that day. So I would say it's really a two headed monster. There's institutions and there's culture, right? The institutions throughout the Trump presidency held him from acting in more authoritarian ways, but barely. And the same thing happened on that day. Uh, the institution of the Electoral College held, right? The uh, Congress actually came back into session early the next morning and did in fact count the electoral votes and certified the rightful winner of the election. However, uh, the loopholes, uh, the legal constitutional loopholes in our system that allow for competing slates of electors, which didn't actually happen that day, but they were trying to stall in order to uh, allow the competing slates of electors to be put forward. Um, that is a loophole that still exists, that hasn't been closed, and Congress has done nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, as a people, even talked really about amending the Constitution or even enforcing the existing provisions of the Constitution, like the Republican Guarantee Clause, to make sure that states respect the popular vote. That's something that Congress can do. It's something I'm hoping to hear from the president in just a few minutes. Here. You know, I, the second I, I thing, though, is cultural, uh, the, which we haven't ahead. addressed at all. Uh-huh. And I understand the institutions that are in place, but let's talk about the mindset. Uh, Suzanne and I have talked about this a couple of times, even people here from California. We're talking about, you know, people who were there who were doctors, who were attorneys, who were mem members of the military, uh, literally like storming the Capitol. That's right. That's the cultural mindset. That's the narrative, right, that we really haven't done anything about. And it's really hard to know what to do about it, right, because you've got I would say on the one hand, you've got these narratives, uh, the narratives that drove the Stop the Steal move movement that brought ordinary people like you're talking about to the Capitol that day are narratives about a real America that's being beset by a kind of increasingly totalitarian left. And if you think about it, just from a personal vantage point, if you really thought that your country was being taken over by totalitarian thugs, you would probably storm the Capitol too, right? So the narrative, uh, it's hard to fight a narrative because a narrative, you know, by its very nature is a story that people are telling about reality. So how do you fight a false view of reality? You fight a false view of reality by telling the true story. And so the media has been doing a fairly good job of that, but I fear that in our own lives, right, we all know people that uh, are susceptible to these kinds of narratives and we're being drawn apart 
by COVID and by a number of other factors going back, you know, all the way to the 1960s, we've been drawing apart as a culture, as a society, our social capital has been fraying. And so, and our, you know, our social media practices are driving this in part as well. So you can't pass laws to deal with those kinds of cultural narratives. You've got to actually deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. And Professor Whitehead, like we've talked about in the past, there are so many concerns because this was basically a president who lost the election and still maintains, did not lose the election. And this is the, uh, you know, an American process that we have a vote and that it's counted. And then it was somebody who was frustrated they lost and then was able to get a big group of people to attack one of our nation's institutions. And of course, I think social media really plays into that because you could have a respected news source post a, an article, but then you could also have some website that just started yesterday put out the opposite sort of article and people can't really determine what's true or not. And then social media feeds them false narratives all the time. How do we remedy that? Yeah, that's that's difficult. That's exactly what I was thinking that it's very difficult to to solve for that kind of a cultural narrative. That's not just about a stolen election. I think we have to think about Trump less as a driver of these kinds of events and more as a symptom of an ongoing problem we've been having as a society that goes back, you know, within the Republican Party and within right wing politics. Uh, this kind of conspiratorial narrative goes back a ways. I mean, all the way to the 1950s and perhaps even further than that. But I think the cultural elements that you're talking about, the ways that we relate to each other on social media, those kinds of things, you know, it's it's important, I think, to make sure that we're training our young people. And this is part of my job as a professor and the job of teachers and the job of parents to train young people how to spot falsity, how to test information online to determine whether or not it's trustworthy. Um, this is not that difficult to do if you spend some time doing it, but I fear that uh, for a lot of people, it's more, it's more interesting to click on the stories and stay in the bubble mm -hmm. that you're in based on the algorithms that major social media companies provide for you to yeah. kind of stay yeah. in your own little bubble Rather online and also in person. So we've got to get out of that bubble.